Welcome back to the Shema Podcast, my friends. I have an exciting episode. Let me first begin, before I bring on our esteemed guest, and talk a little bit about what brought me to want to cover this subject. So back in my, my late 20s, I was, I guess, searching for some meaning. You know, I was living life as an atheist. And I consulted with a friend, and we were talking about my life. And he turned to me and he said, you know, it seems like everything you describe about your life is about how you're lacking in something and how you can get more of the world around you. And I said, of course, what else is there? And he made a suggestion to me that maybe I should carve out a little time of my life where I'm focused on helping others. Now, it didn't make any logical sense, but it emotionally felt right. And I immediately, over the next week, found two things I began to do. One is I researched and came across an organization I began to volunteer with called Child Advocates, where I was a volunteer guardian ad litem for kids and child protective services. And the other thing I started doing was donating blood. I gave blood at minimum four times a year from the age of 29, really all the way up until I moved to this community. I guess just the move just changed all my my normal patterns of living. I should probably resume that. But the point I want to make to you is this. During that entire span of my life from age 30 to 40 as an atheist, those activities, it made me feel good. It was pleasurable. Although I was always struggling with trying to understand logically why that is so, why I was taking time on my day to help these kids out and why I was going and donating blood every quarter. It logically didn't make any sense, but I did it because there was something about it that was pleasurable. Now, looking back on my life and and knowing what I know now, I can understand that even without a recognition of my creator, That act of giving to someone else, something that can save their life or benefit their life, that state of giving is what aligned me to some degree with my creator. And that is why I now understand logically why I found it pleasurable. And as I began to learn and study under Rabbi Yochal Fulby, this whole idea of organ donation came up because I had sign the back of my driver's license or however you authorized that if something happens to you, take my spare parts, give them to someone else. I don't need them. And he did guide me into a path and said, there's a lot of halakhic areas around this to ensure that whether it's permissible or not permissible. But I think the reason I want to cover this is there is an aspect of us, especially with the Jewish people where we are just naturally inclined to want to help out and save lives and do what we can do. It's what aligns us with our creator. But there are a lot of halakhic complications around this. So I wanted to bring on Rabbi Grossman, someone that has a long history with Torch, and have him go through and explain, and we can have a conversation and learn the ins and outs of this very complex subject. Welcome to the Shema Podcast. The podcast for the perplexed, where Torah insights intertwined through personal stories as well as interviews with leading Torah scholars demonstrate the empowering qualities of Torah and mitzvot. For more great Torah learning through Torch, the Torah Outreach Center of Houston, go to torchweb.org. Now to the show. Rabbi Grossman, welcome to the Shmuel Podcast. Thank you for having me. Well, it's, I never knew uh, that's too much information for me <laughs> about yourself. That's beautiful, but amazing uh, idealism there. I hope you retain that idealism in the future. Thank you, Rabbi. If you could begin to sort of talk about that, you have this history with Torch as well. I was actually with Rabbi Nagel. I know he's been on this podcast, I'm sure. Yes. Um, we were the original, there were four founders of Torch in 1998, we moved together to Houston, Texas, to found for the purpose of founding Torch. Um, I don't know if Rabbi Nagel has spoken about it here. Me and him were buddies and chavrusas back in Queens, New York. Okay. And uh, he really wasn't looking to move, but I convinced him. And we came down here with two other young couples at the time in 1998. At that point, the, the goal of the organization, as you know, was outreach. And we, st- we started studying, we started teaching at the time. And it was just it just took off. It was amazing. At that time... 
I was, we were coming both, again, straight out of Kola, um, Queens, New York, in a place from a yeshiva called Shara HaTorah. We really didn't know uh, much about Texas, much about anything, uh-huh. except Torah. But what happened was, since Houston is one of the biggest medical centers, so one of the first things after moving down here was we got a lot of requests to teach uh, Jewish medical ethics. And they kept on saying, Rabbi Grossman, can you teach a class on Jewish medical ethics on the Parsha of the Week? And I said, I don't see any connection between the two. But after being forced into it, at the time, that sort of piqued my interest, and I started studying more specifically about this topic of Jewish medical ethics, not knowing that how vast the topic is. I mean, it's, I'm still, uh, it's now 24 years later, and still uh, only touching the tip of the iceberg. Well, let me ask you a question. So you're saying you were able to extract medical ethics from each Parsha? Yes. Wow. Believe it or not, I was shocked also. <laughs> um, so when I started, I was very uh, pessimistic about the idea, but after we had a, they organized a group of doctors together in the medical center, it was 7.30 a.m. every Wednesday morning. And uh, we had a group of around between 10 and 15 doctors on your average Wednesday, and they were fascinated by it. That class, by the way, is my longest running class. It's still the same class. It's still actually going. Amazing. I still give it now. It's at 8.30 on Wednesday mornings. Thank God it got a little later. To some of the same core group is still with the class, uh, Twenty, literally 24 years. And I'm in the midst of writing a book, publishing a book. Actually, the book is written, Medical Ethics on the Parish of the Week. So Beautiful. from that original class, yeah. It's just fascinating. And the, believe it or not, what I've discovered is there's probably, I have a list of at least five different medical topics on every single parish, connected to every single parish. Wow. So it's the, one of the things and what amazes me is, first of all, I learned a lot of medicine. I, haven't, I don't have any, uh, don't have a medical degree, but I mean, I just, it's amazing how much, and I'm sure you've heard, spoken about this before, how much is in the Torah, relevant to science, and how much you can learn from the Torah, and besides the Torah itself, the Talmud and different interpretations, literally discussing topics which you think is from 2,000 years ago, but how practically relevant they are to common day contemporary issues in medicine and science and many other areas. So that's something that shocked me and amazed me, and it's still every time I discover a topic, and, and the, the physicians themselves and the scientists were blown away by this. It turned into, uh, then turned into at some point in Torch, a separate entity, it was called, we called it the Jewish Ethics Institute, um, in 2009 I believe that happened, and then from there um, it became a national organization, that's when I left Torch and sort of focused just specifically on not just it's called the Jewish Ethics Institute, which focuses not just on medical ethics, business ethics from a Jewish perspective, from a halachic perspective, and also legal ethics. So we give classes to attorneys, to physicians, to uh, we have a medical conference annually, which haven't happened since COVID, but uh, we had one right before COVID, where we do a big conference, a one-day conference, but we're always giving classes. Currently, I, I give at least two or three classes a week on Jewish medical ethics. Okay. So it's, uh, it's amazing. So are these classes all in-person classes, or do you do anything online for someone who may until, not be? Uh, until COVID, everything was in person, but I do have, everything is recorded, um, and everything is online at your favorite, um, wherever you get your podcasts. So you, you can just either search for Rabbi Yossi Grossman or Jewish Ethics Institute, and it will come up. I have around probably 150, 200 classes online. Okay. Since COVID, we do have, um, we do it, uh, and one of the classes is on Zoom regularly. So okay. if anyone it, wants to contact me, they can at ygrossman, j at, at j-ethics.org. Great. Awesome. And so it's, it's medical and business. Medical and business and legal. And legal. legal. Ethics. And we're accredited, by the way, you can get continuing education for physicians, for attorneys, just by attending our classes. That's amazing. So are the classes and the legal and business matters, are they able to extract something from every Parsha as well? So I have, for the business ethics, I do have something on every Parsha. The legal is, I, didn't, I never tried. I'm sure there is. Now question, but I just never, uh, never it, went there. That's just, it's just the, the level of wisdom in Torah being so infinite that yes, it just makes very, sense that like if you I want said, to study the, anything... You could extract something 100%. on that topic. I mean, it's just wow. it's just amazing to, to the scientists, especially. They're like shocked that, and it was and it was easy. It's probably one of my. Uh, I, mean, I thought when I started, it was it sounds crazy, but it was one of the it's one of my best classes, easiest classes to for me to prepare because 
it's just plugging it in, you know, finding a topic in the parasha which plugs what it plugs into, and and you always find the commentaries there discuss something medical, and almost literally on almost every parasha. That is incredible. Okay, so the 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 topic at hand is about organ donation when we're alive, when we pass. Is this something that we can do, not do? What are the considerations we need to take if we want to do something like this? Tell us what we need to know. As we're going to see, it's a very complex topic, obviously, but we will try to get as much in as possible in the podcast. But, I mean, the fact that one of the amazing things about medicine and science, which I really don't have to say, I'm sure everyone realizes that, if if you're living in this decade or decades, in the last 50 years, I would say, we're living in just astounding times and inspiring times in the sense of literally miraculous of what science and medicine can do to help people today, which I think for the first thing is we need to be thankful for Hashem for the amazing revelations that have happened, I would say, over the past 50, 60 years. And so many areas of medicine and science. But one of the most amazing new technologies, as you're mentioning, is the ability to transplant organs from one human to another. Um, that's, I would say, an educated, uneducated guess. It's probably 40 to 50 years old, maybe a little longer. The first heart transplant, I believe, was in 1967. So what happens is, like all new technologies, and this is something, again, that continue, amazes, amazed me and shocked me when I started getting into these topics, continuously amazes me every time I learn something new. And there's always some new technologies coming out. You have uterine transplants, and I mean, just amazing what, what's happening today. And all of it has to be addressed, just like everything in our lives, through a halachic prism. And it has to be, uh, as you mentioned, discussed to see, is it permitted? And if it is permitted, what criteria do we allow it? And then once we do, we, we say it is allowed and it's permitted, the question then becomes, as you mentioned, is it a mitzvah? Is it obligatory? When we say a mitzvah in this context, I mean, is it obligatory? A mitzvah, there's two ways to translate mitzvah. Mitzvah means a nice, good deed, which for sure, assuming it's permitted, is of course a good deed. But many times, as we know, the Torah obligates us to do good deeds. It's not just, it's not just a nice thing to, you know, to put on your checklist, but it's something that might be obligatory. So the question then becomes, if organ transplantation is permitted according to halakha, According to Jewish law, then does it become obligatory for me to do- donate my kidney to someone who needs a kidney, or for me to sign a carry a donor card saying that that I need, I want to donate, as you said, all my spare parts. Well, after you die, they're all spare, right? All all your parts um, after you die. So how does so one dies? So how does that work? Um, that's obviously the the main questions here. So as we said, it's a very complex subject, and the question is not just about donating organs because it's even about receiving organs. Because if you, if you believe, you, let's say, for whatever reason, and we'll get to some of the reasons, that it, you cannot donate organs, halakhically, in certain scenarios, so then the assumption would be you can't receive those organs either. So if, God forbid, someone needs a life-saving kidney or a life-saving um, whatever it may be, a heart transplant, and they believe that removing someone's heart to transplant is prohibited, so how could you receive that organ? You're really enabling that whoever cut out that heart to sin. So the question becomes, you know, there's a question of donation and, right. and being a recipient. Yes. It's a two-way street. And it's hard, and it's one of the things that people struggle with, because if you're of that opinion, as we'll see, in some cases where you can't donate, can I allow, can I receive one? And as we know, unfortunately, there are, I believe they're saying, and kidney, I'm making up this number, something like 95,000 people on the kidney uh, transplant waiting to get a kidney in the United States. There's a major shortage of organs, not just in the United States, all over the world. You know, but if you live in China, it's a little easier. They go into prison and they just uh, take what they need, <laughs> right? So, but in the United States, where you can't, there's no black market. I mean, there, I'm sure there is. I don't know. I'm not involved in it. But there's, you can't just go and buy an organ on eBay. Um, right. That's illegal in the United States, and I wouldn't suggest that. But the question then becomes, how, you know, am I even allowed to receive an organ if I'm of the opinion, halachic opinion, that I can't donate one? So, so it's a complicated issue in that sense. Okay. I don't know if you're going to address this, but I have been reading a lot that they are learning how to sort of grow organs for transplant, but they're doing it with pig tissue. Yes. So. Yeah, so that's the, uh, actually my grandmother, I would say probably 40 years ago, got a heart valve transplanted, which is a, from a pig. 
and I believe there's uh, what's that that medical TV show, the old one. But I don't remember the name. Uh, I, I'm just thinking of uh, Doogie Howser. <laughs> <laughs> so whatever whatever the name was. So they once had an episode, you know, where they had an Orthodox Jewish girl in the episode. Again, it's fiction. Stating who needed a heart valve transplant, and it was from a pig, and she refused to accept it because she was Orthodox. So that's one of the things which I want to talk about today. One of the complex issues. There's so many myths involved, and in, in in what the Jewish view is, and that have to be dispelled, and that's something we'll try to address. But there's no question whatsoever you can accept any organs from pigs, from uh, camels, whatever uh, animal you like. Without that's not even a question. Okay. It's not even you know we don't even have to address that. Allah only prohibits ingesting non-kosher animals. If you're not going to ingest it, if it's going to be... I mean, as a matter of fact, you could even shoot yourself up with pig, you know, if you want technically into your veins. That doesn't... There's no prohibition. It's only ingesting and eating non-kosher species. Okay. So that's to, just to get that off the table. But, right. there's, but again, there's so many myths, and including, as you see, of course, the Jewish Hollywood writers of the show who had no idea. Most Jews, and let's be honest, know nothing... And they only hear the myths. Of course, you have to be buried with all your organs, etc., as we're going to discuss. So, so that's something, yes, that has to be... Many of the myths have to be dispelled, and hopefully by the end of this podcast, they will. At least we'll try. Great. Well, let's start with the probably the easier topic, which is donating organs when you're alive, like kidneys, because I know that's huge in the Jewish community. Yes. So, yes. So, the huge in what way? Huge. There's the number of people I hear of Jews yes. that are more than happy to donate a kidney yes. to a it's fellow an Jew. Amazing thing. It's, it's a it's a recent phenomenon. I would say in the past ten years probably. Or, um, but it's it's there's an organization and it's worth going to their website. I mean, I cry when I see their videos. Literally, I mean, it's just amazing to see Jews. I'm starting to cry just talking now. It's an organization called Renewal. That O R G Renewal. And basically, it was an organization founded by, I think, Hasidic people, who their whole goal is to help facilitate kidney transplants for people, Jewish people, not only in the Orthodox community and any community, and they'll, they'll help non-Jews too. I mean, we started by Hasidic Jews with, obviously, to help the community, but they don't discriminate. But the way it works is basically they educate, they go into, they go into shuls, and they do drives, and they have people register, be swabbed. Or if they're looking for a specific individual or general, they have their own list, people who come to them. And the way it works is, of course, as we mentioned, there's a huge waiting list. The average wait time, I think, is between six or seven years to get a kidney in the United States. So what they do is you, are, you can, if, I mean, I, if someone specifically needs a kidney, they have a right to, of course, look within their family and their friends and do a drive for themselves. And they, then that kidney will be do- targeted to that specific person. So that, that's way you, this way you bypass the waiting list. That's one way to bypass the 60, as we said, 90,000 strong waiting list, which can take many years, and people die on that waiting list. So what this organization does is they usually also people, obviously the closer DNA of the people involved, the better chance of a match. Besides, the, obviously, the basics, which is blood match, and you have to be blood matched, etc. Um, there's also the closer the DNA, and that's why family members have much better chance of a successful donation because little I know, again, I'm not a medical expert, under, don't take this as medical guidance, this is a disclaimer, please don't sue this podcast. If uh, <laughs> um, The chances, as we know, one of the things is graft versus host disease, the body rejects, even if it's a match, the body can reject the organ. Once, as long as the, the, the closer the DNA is, the less chance of rejection by the body. So therefore, within the Jewish community, we're Let's say, let's say it's an Ashkenazi person and they're looking in the Ashkenazi community or in a Hasidic community where everyone is in this particular Hasidic community might be of Hungarian descent. And they do a drive for this person of matches. It's a chance of coming up with a match since you're both from the same area. You're both Jewish, you're both Hungarian descent, let's say. Or if it's Sephardic, you're both from Morocco, whatever it is. It, the chances are much higher to find a, someone who matches. And that's what they do. And they have a database of literally by now hundreds of thousands of people. I'm in that database. Anyone can go be in that database. They're an amazing organization. I don't need to, they don't need to be plugged, but you should check them out. And live donation, there's no question. Everyone agrees. It's 100% permitted, halakhically speaking. And as we're going to see, it doesn't have the potential obstacles of donation after death that we're going to discuss in a few minutes. But it's 100% permitted. That's not the question. The question is only... Again, does it become obligatory? Because once it's permitted, Allah now, is it a mitzvah? If I can save a fellow's life, so we're going to talk about that a little more later, but if I can save someone's life, 
It's a, that's a biblical obligation. So meaning if you're driving down uh, Braisewood, um, I don't know if the national audience will going across the George Washington Bridge and you see someone you know, drowning in the Hudson River and you're a good swimmer, technically speaking, you are obligated, biblically speaking, there's a verse in the Torah that says, do not stand idly by while your brother's blood is being shed. There's another mitzvah in the Torah, another one in the 613, which is, you, you're obligated, the Gemara in Sanhedrin, Talmud in Sanhedrin says, you're obligated to return someone's health to them if you can. So that means even if you're not a doctor, you can save someone from drowning, you know how to swim, you have to jump in and save them. Those are biblical obligations okay. without question. So the question right. now becomes, why don't we all have to go and be swabbed and help and donate our kidneys? Because one, you can live with one kidney, right? As long as you're a healthy person and you're, you have no kidney disease. Most people don't get kidney disease. It's very rare, you know, again. So you should have technically this obligation. So, and this is discussed in various responses by contemporary authorities. This question was posed to Ravad Yosef, to Ramon Feinstein, to many halachic authorities over the years. And the conclusion more or less is, although that might change in the future, is yes, it's a mitzvah in the sense of it's a laudable act and it's a beautiful thing, but it's not obligatory. And the reason being is because you don't have to risk your own life to save someone else's life. And since a kidney donor surgery is, there are risks involved, very, there are minimal risks, true, not minimal, minimal statistically, I mean. They're, they're, if something goes wrong in the surgery, obviously, you know, a person can bleed to death. There are many things that can go wrong in the surgery. It's a serious surgery, and uh, you're going to be put through a lot of pain. That's a separate issue of how much pain do you have to go through to perform a mitzvah, and how much do I have to give away? Do I have to give away an organ to, to fulfill this mitzvah of saving someone's life? So because of the risk involved, mo- almost all authorities, like say almost all, and I believe it might be all, but I don't want to rule anyone out, um, agree that it's permitted it's a laudable deed. It's something that's, if you're able to do it, it's beautiful. But you're not obligated because of the risk involved. I just want to point, uh, dwell on that for one second, meaning it's a fascinating thing in Judaism, which uh, people are not aware of. Um, you know, where, as we know, Judaism is a great religion. Um, but one of the beauties is, yes, you're obligated. By the way, in Western law, you're not obligated to save anyone's life. If someone's drowning or you see someone jump off the bridge and you're late for your meeting at work in, in American law, you can wave to them and say, sorry, I'm late for my meeting, and, uh, and you did nothing wrong. I mean, obviously you're an idiot, maybe. <laughs> right. But you're, meaning legally, there's nothing wrong. In Jewish law, as we're saying, there's an obligation. It means if you wave to the guy who's jumping off the bridge, you didn't stop and try to help him, or even if you know how to swim, like you're saying, and jump in and try to save him, assuming you're a good swimmer and it's steady water, then you're, you're not only, you did something wrong, you violated a biblical command, the negative commandment, and maybe even a positive commitment, maybe both. Okay, so it's, it's a serious offense in Jewish law. It's very different than secular law. But on the other hand, if you risk your life to save someone, that means, let's say someone's uh, being mugged, okay, with uh, someone's being held up at gunpoint, and you do not have a gun, and you're not, or someone like me might have a gun, but you're not a good sh- shot, right. and you go ahead and try to save that person, where you're literally putting your life in danger. So not only says halacha, um, this is a, a response from the Ridvaz in the 1100s, 1200s. Not isn't that obligatory. You're not a hero, not only, and you're not a hero. Um, you know, in, in Western law, if you take the bullet for the president, you're a hero, right? Take the bullet for someone else. Right. In Jewish law, it says you're a pious fool. Meaning, you, you, listen, it's very nice. You're trying to be pious and beautiful and saving someone else's life, but at the expense, you know, you're being altruistic at the expense of your life and your family, right? If God forbid something happens to you. You're, you know, your your wife's not going to be in a happy state. Depends if you have life insurance or not. Your kids are not going to be in a good situation. So risking your life to save someone else's life is viewed as, as foolish. Because our our body itself is not even ours oh, to so make choices definitely. on. Right. That, that's the big. That's the major thing that we're going to talk about. Okay. Relevant to organ donation also. So that's a very good point you bring up. Um, so so that's so, but again as far as living donation it's laudable it's beautiful because the risk it's sort of an in between stage the risk is not sufficient to say you're a fool by doing it because again you can live a beautiful life with one kidney you know ninety I think the numbers and again this is an estimated guess a guesstimate somewhat educated but I don't know for sure I don't want to say the exact numbers but somewhere of ninety eight percent of people come through even major surgeries if you're healthy okay. So, you know, it's a 2% risk. It's a small enough risk that it doesn't prohibit you from donating your kidney, 
But because of that risk and the pain involved, also you have to take off from work, the pain involved does not obligate you to, to, do the, to donate your kidney. But if you want to do it, and I've looked into this, I've, I've had that urge, my wife talked me out of it, and, and some other doctors. Um, but I, I, I mean, the people, if you speak to people who've done it, I mean, they change their life. Yes. I met a, hu- a husband and wife. That, I mean, like you said, if you go to this website, you watch the videos, I mean, you literally, I cry. And it's something I wish I aspired to do one day. Hopefully I'll get there. You only have till 60, I think, till 70, where they'll take your kidney. So I got time, thank God, to make my decision. But uh, I would recommend it highly for someone who, again, they, you have to have a psychological evaluation. They want to know why you're doing it, obviously, it's be for the right, you know, reasons. And But... Anyone who spoke to, and I've met many people who've done it, it literally changed their life. And yes. You meet the person. I mean, in these cases with renewal, they have, first of all, they have a dinner every year. And every, all the donors are invited and all the recipients are invited. It's amazing. They go for a weekend and the people meet each other. I mean, you're literally part of this person. I mean, you, yeah, that's you incredible. save this person's life. I mean, the, can you imagine the emotions that go through there. It's just uh, amazing. Husbands and wives have done it together, um, not just to each other. That's a beautiful love story, but... To strangers, and they meet. I mean, and they get together with the couples they've saved, and just a, it's an amazing thing. I wow. recommend it highly. Again, not talking from experience, just from people I've spoken to, and it's a hundred percent permitted halachically as long as you're healthy and obviously you don't have kidney disease, or you don't want to give away your kidney in that situation, and that's not good for the person who's getting it either. It's just amazing, and you you can save someone's life in the literal sense. So that's really not a halachic question. Again, the only question would be, is it obligatory, is it not? And that seems to be, almost everyone says, it's not. Although, the less, as time progresses, and the surgery might become less risky, less risk involved, so then, you know, then, then the halacha might change in the sense of, I don't know, it's, people think halacha can't change. It's important to note also. Halacha can't change, that's true. Halacha is eternal. As we know, Jewish law is always eternal. But if the science changes, then the halacha... Halacha is only as good as the science. So when we as a rabbi, let's say, are ruling on a medical ethics case, a medical issue in halacha such as this, such as, so we work with the numbers given to us by science. So if the numbers change, so let's say defining risk in this case is really what, what the issue, what is the halachic definition of risk? Because as we know today, everything is considered risk. You know, driving on 610 is probably a lot more risky than, right. than, a lot, than the yeah. surgery, than donating your kidney. Exactly. Okay, so, but how, does, how is risk defined? Bungee jumping, you know, can I go downhill skiing on the black diamond, the course? You know, it's where do you draw the line? And it's a gray area. Halacha is not, doesn't clearly define that. It's one of the gray areas in halacha. What's considered risk? And there's a lot of factors involved. So if the science, if the surgery becomes better, or you're saying, let's say, they can do it in a way where there's literally minimal risk to the donor, so then things, of course, will change. Um, there are other issues. Moshe Feinstein, I think, is of the opinion you're not obligated to give up an organ in either case, even without the risk factor. I believe he says this in a response, and because, like any mitzvah, I don't have to give, I don't have to give away more than a fifth of my net worth to perform a mitzvah. I don't know if you're aware of that principle. Okay. Okay. So that's a principle for a for a positive commandment. I do not have to give away more than a fifth of my net worth to fill. Let's say I can't afford to fill in. Buying a pair of tefillin would cost more than a fifth of my net worth. I don't have to give away, I don't have to buy a tefillin. So he says giving away an organ is sort of in that same category. Okay. Where I'm not obligated to do that. Again, it's a mitzvah. I can give, I can spend more on tefillin if I'd like. Same thing, I could give away an organ, but I'm not obligated for that reason. So that's a whole, we're not going to go there. Okay, so let me ask you a question. So as I mentioned, I used to like give blood all the time. So I got out of the habit when I moved here. I did it for to about 20 years. That's probably zero risk. Is there an obligation? Interesting, yes. Yeah. So, so again, if you're giving it to, if there's a need for it, which, as we know, many times there's shortages, and there's no question you could do it. It's actually healthy. They say it's good for you. It's not even, not only it's not a risk, it's good for you, besides the donuts they give you afterwards. Um, otherwise, it's good for you. So, yeah, I would say, in a certain sense, if, if you're doing it to help someone, Especially, by the way, you know, when they, you can earmark it. Obviously, that blood is not earmarked, but they put it in the bank, if, even if you're not the same type, but they then can give to someone. So let's say I've had cases here in Houston where someone needed blood, a certain type of blood, but they said if you come down to donate, they'll, they'll give... They'll credit you know, the they'll person. Credit, right, exactly. Yeah. So then 100%, it's, I would say it's obligatory. Okay. If you can do it easily. As far as if you earmarking it for a donor, I would say it's 100% obligatory. 
to do it. Okay. Uh, in that case. If you know, if you know yeah, the person Yeah, if you're giving it to someone, I mean, if someone needs it and you're, yeah, we'll talk about that a little more. Uh, okay. The, coming up, so. Okay, great. So that's as far as live donor is concerned. Again, highly recommended, easy for me to say, I and mean, I've never done it, but hopefully one day I'll reach that level where I can be, I can get the courage to do it. It's just, it's an amazing, I, I did swab recently for someone in the community who they were doing a drive for, you know, and I, I called the guy, and I'm friendly with him, I was joking with him. He did have, his son ended up donating a kidney, it was a match, but I told the guy, um, someone who used to live here, and I told him, uh, you know, listen, I'm not saying I'm, I'm going to get swabbed, I'm not saying I'm going to do it for you, but uh, I'm going to get swabbed, and then we'll discuss, we'll negotiate afterwards. So, uh, yeah, so that's as far as live donation. So are you ready to move on to... Yeah, let's go. To, so there's, there's basically, as we're going to see, there's three obstacles that need to be overcome, which I'll put out there. Um, right away. Okay, so there, there are three potential obstacles. The first one is what we call the prohibition of being nene, that means deriving benefit from a dead body. Okay, that's a, okay. That's a prohibition. As we're going to see, it's questionable if it's rabb- biblical or rabbinical. But that's issue number one. I mean, there's no greater benefit, you can argue, than getting an organ from a deceased body. You're deriving benefit from a body. And that's prohibited, again, in Jewish law to derive benefit from a human body. Okay. So that's question number one. I- issue number one, which we'll address. A similar issue, there's a prohibition called nivul hamet, which means literally mutilation of a body or desecrating a body. So the Torah talks about, it's interesting, and it's in the context of a executed, a victim who, who was a, executed for a capital crime in Jewish law, as we know. Jewish law, the Torah does talk about capital punishment. And the Torah says there explicitly, you shall not defile the body. So even someone like that, and we're talking about someone who did a terrible thing, who, who violated a capital crime, even their body, it says, shouldn't be defiled, shouldn't be mutilated in any which way. So for sure, we understand the Talmud extrapolates from that. A, someone who is, is a tzaddik, is not, who didn't do anything wrong, right, who didn't do this terrible capital crime, surely his body cannot be mutilated. So the, and, it, and it says, actually interesting, the Rashi says the reason there, it describes it in the Torah, the reason being, this is in Parashat Kiseitze, in Deuteronomy, Rashi says, is because ki, the Torah actually says, ki nivlas elokim talo, the a desecration of God is hanging. It's talking about, he wasn't hung, he, he was, his body was hanging. And it says, you're, it's a desecration of God to leave the body hanging. Rashi explains the reason is because we're all created in the image of God. And if a body which was created in the image of God is now hanging, that's a des- sort of a desecration of God's name. It's people look and say, it's like God's hanging almost. It's like your twin brother. Right. So it doesn't mean, I always say it doesn't mean we, I hope God doesn't look like me. That would be bad. Um, but, uh, but, in, but in that sense, since we're all created in the image of God, in that sense, and that's why it could be it applies in Jewish bodies, non-Jewish bodies, there's no distinction if that's the, the philosophy behind it. So okay. It's an important aspect. So that's another issue. So when you're going to do surgery, removing an organ post-mortem, the assumption is there's going to be a, what's called nivel amid, desecration of the body. Although okay. it's not so simple, depending on the organ, obviously, and etc. But let's, that's, that's issue number two. And issue number three, of course, is the biblical obligation, this is what everyone knows about, um, the assumption is a biblical obligation to bury a body. A Jewish body has to be buried. A Non-Jewish body is questionable, if this is only one of the 613 for Jews. As, as many of them are. Most of them, as we know, are just for Jew, Jews. So according to many, it's just this obligation is just for Jews that you have to bury a body. That, the assumption is everything included in that body. As we know, there are organizations in Israel, um, God forbid, after a terrorist attack, where they go and pick up little bitty pieces you know, that got blown up for this reason, because there's an obligation of burial. So wow. they go and they climb the walls, they scrape, and it's pretty morbid, but that's part of what they do. Is they have to make sure to get all the limbs and bits and pieces to make sure everything is included in the burial. Okay. And that's that organization, famous organization known as Zaka. And that's all they do because it's such an important mitzvah, the burial of a Jewish body. And as we know, Israel changes prisoners, you know, you know live hundreds of terrorists for one uh, Israeli soldier, the corpse of one Israeli soldier had been done, arguably whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. But, but the reason is because we have such a, we treat a body with such reverence and holiness a Jewish body because what it was even though it's no longer alive but it's, it was a vessel that held the soul that held the neshama and it's holy even after death that's why this, that's the assumption of this prohibition and therefore we 
can't mutilate it, we can't derive benefit from it, just like any holy object. We can't, and it needs to be buried. As the Torah says in that, by the way, in the same context there, we're talking about the executed uh, person who was killed for capital crime and a capital punishment. Um, That's where it says also that he must be buried that very same day, the Torah says. Now we do push off the burial for the sake of the honor of the dead, let's say this. Relatives have to fly in to Israel or to America from out of town, so we'll push off the funeral, as we know. But So some might make the argument here, in the case of uh, organ donation, it's a, maybe that's an honor for the dead to have his organs. But uh, I didn't see anyone who really agrees with that argument. I um, haven't found anyone who agrees with that argument. So these are, those are the three basic obstacles that have to be overcome to allow organ donation after death. Okay, very good. All right, so now we'll go through... Each one of these, because it seems like, yes. number one, how do you even get around that one to not right. drive benefit from a... Right. So before we... Yes, we're going to go to there in a second. But before that, I just want to start very clearly, and this is key, a key point, which has to be very clear, that this now... I mean, I was going to address it head on, which is there's a concept in halacha called pikuach nefesh. I don't know if you're familiar with that term, which means saving of a life. Okay, saving of a life, as we know, in Jewish law, overrides basically all of the 613 commandments, not completely all 610 commandments. There are three, there are only three exceptions to that, which we're not going to get into now, but I'll mention them, which is the only exceptions that are not, meaning life is of utmost importance in Jewish law. So that means, as we know, you can eat on Yom Kippur if, if the doctor says you have to, because right, even though it's the holiest day of the year, life overrides. Um, saving a life overrides that. If you eat on Yom Kippur, you can eat chametz on Pesach, Right, all this is allowed in order to save lives. So the only three exceptions, by the way, are not what's known. I call them the big three, which is idolatry. That means you know someone puts a gun to your head and says, "Bow to baby Jesus, or I'll shoot you." So in that case, you would not be allowed to bow to baby Jesus, even if it's, even if that's not your intention, even if you're faking it. Still, doesn't make a difference. That's prohibited, and you have to give up your life, sacrifice your life for that. The other one is adultery and other forms of sexual immorality. Okay, halachic adultery. Right. My, my wife had that uh, mitzvah imposed on me back before you were religious too. <laughs> right. She, said, right. <laughs> she put a gun to it. Yeah, exactly. Right. So that's, that, of course, is, a, is another one, is number two. And the third one, adultery, adultery, and murder. Okay, and as we'll see, this comes in over here. That means someone puts a gun to your head and says, kill this person or I'll kill you. Um, you have to let yourself be killed because, before permitting murder. Okay. Okay. Um, those are the only exceptions to the rule. Everything else, if someone puts a gun to your head and says, violate Shabbat, eat pork, eat a double cheese, bacon cheese, and with a mac on Yom Kippur, with the lettuce, which has many bugs in it, you gotta do, you're obligated to, and as a matter of fact, it becomes a mitzvah to do that on Yom Kippur. So it means if someone walks to shul and puts a gun to your head and says, eat this double bacon and cheese on Yom Kippur and drive to get it at Whataburger, you are now, it becomes a mitzvah to do that. Because the Torah says, v'chai you shall live by all the commandments. And the, it's the assumption, and the, the Talmud interprets that to mean that if any commandment of the Torah is in any which way threatening your life, then it because it's it's not a commandment. The mitzvah is to live by the commandment. So are, are you obligated? For, for So if someone puts a gun to your head and says, I want you to eat this trafe. You have to eat it. You have to eat it. Yeah, you can't try karate, you know, risk your life, like we said before. Maybe, you know, I'll, I'll knock the gun out of his hand not to eat the burger. No. You have to 100% agree to eat it. It's a mitzvah now to eat that burger. That book burger could be even you make a bracha when you eat the burger because it's now, uh, it's obligatory to eat it because the Torah says you shall live by the mitzvah. That means in this case where if you try to observe the mitzvah, your life will be threatened. You have to, you okay. can't do that. That's then you're in violation of this law, v'chai bahem, you shall live by the mitzvah. So that being said, so now if, if we're saying, yeah, very nice, there are three biblical, maybe rabbinical, obligations, which is um, burial of a dead body. And now we're talking about, again, it's talking about body that needs, someone needs the heart to live. Another a recipient, right? The recipient is waiting for this heart. Um, or you have, right, whatever the case, they're waiting for this kidney. And this body's now dead. It's a no-brainer. Halachically speaking, if it's something that can save someone's life, all these three issues that we mentioned, which is, again, the body has to be buried. It's a very nice mitzvah in the Torah. Do not mutilate the body. Don't derive benefit from the body. All those are very important mitzvahs, but if you can save someone's life by overriding that mitzvah, it becomes gotcha. 100% okay. irrelevant. The question is moot. You have to do that, of course. It's not as simple as I make it, but 
that's for argument's sake at this point. So meaning when we're dealing with a organ, and this is an important myth because, as we're saying, people think, oh, Judaism, you can't, body has to be buried. It's, it's very funny that I've seen videos of uh, secular Israelis where, where this organization that deals with, uh, and I'll mention them briefly, called Hodes, a Malachic Organ Donation Society, and they promote a Jewish organ donation. We'll talk about it. We'll talk about that a little more, but they, they have made videos where I've seen the founder going around and interviewing, you know, to cafes in Israel and saying, would you donate your organ, you know, to, as to seculars? Yeah, totally secular. As they're eating in the cafes, you know, they're probably eating, you know, ham sandwiches. But right. Just, God forbid, I would never do that. Don't you know Judaism says you have to bury them there? <laughs> of course, the body has to be there, buried. So these are people who know very little about Judaism, but the first assumption, and I think most Jews who are uneducated in Torah, and even those who are, some of them, unfortunately, will say, what do you mean? There's an obligation to bury the dead. How could you give, how could you donate their organ? It's against Allah. So, so it's, it's, this is one of the first myths that need to be dispelled. There's nothing that is against Allah, even though the Torah says, yes, they're correct. The body has to be buried, and as quick as possible, and we don't mutilate the body, etc., etc. We don't derive benefit, but... When it comes to saving a life, life overrides everything. It's not one of the big three. And therefore, it's overridden. Okay, so that's gotcha. getting it out of the way. So the only question now becomes really, there's two questions that we'll have to address. And that's why I'm saying it's not so simple. And this is the complex part. There's an issue, which is the issue of uh, what's the definition of death, halachically? Because right. as we know, and we'll get into that a little more, but the main, there's a big argument in the scientific world, there was at least, you know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, which is at which point medically is a person considered dead, okay? Which is, is it cessation of breathing or is it cardiac sensation, cessation of the heart? Okay, at which point does science define death? So that's very nice. Science could define death. I always say this is really not a scientific question. It's a, it's a theological question because what's death? At least in Judaism, we believe, and I can't speak for other religions, I assume it's pretty similar. Death is when the soul leaves the body, right? So that's not a medical question. Not something they could define by science. science. You, can't, you can't measure that. <laughs> right. I right. mean, maybe halachli you can measure it, or maybe okay. if you're a Kabbalist, you can see the soul ascending from the body, but I'm not, I don't get paid enough, so I'm not a... We're not on that pay I'm grade. I'm not a Kabbalist, to... yeah. I'm not okay. on that pay, that's past my pay grade. So, so, but science it's, can't define when you're dead, really. They can say when the insurance company stops paying, or they can say when they want to kick you out of the bed because they need it, because they want to make more money for the next patient right. coming in and... They consider, and the insurance will continue paying, but, but they can't, the criteria of death is really a theological question, which has to be defined by each individual religion, and I'm assuming it is, I can only speak for Judaism. So therefore, it's very nice that, let's say in today's medical terms, in the Western, most of the Western world, defines death by cessation of brain function. And, and by the way, this was an interesting thing, because it wasn't relevant until they invented the ventilator, meaning this question was a moot question, in a sense, because it used to be when someone's brain stopped functioning, so within the next three minutes or four minutes or five minutes maximum, they would stop, their heart okay. would stop. Because since once your brain stops functioning, so you have cessation of brain function, then there's no thing sending a message to brains. Once they invented okay. a ventilator, so what the ventilator did was it sort of artificially breathes for you and, and continues pumping oxygen to the heart without the brain sending the message to do that, for your body to do that okay. on its own. So once the ventilator was invented, and I can't tell you what year, let's say somewhere in the 50s, 60s, so that's when now there was all of a sudden, now what do you do? The, person, the person's brain stopped functioning, so technically they would die any time before the invention of this new machine, this new technology. But now that uh, we have the ventilator, so now you have two points of death because the brain stops functioning, we hook the guy up to a ventilator, he can live for another two years now on his ventilator and his heart is, continues to pump even though it's total cessation of brain function. So now science had to decide, is the guy dead, is he not dead in, those two, in that two-year period? Does his wife start collecting life insurance you know, or not? Okay, so, so it became very complicated. And science, I don't know at which point they did make a decision. I'll discuss that a little. But it now became a halacha question, because it's much more importantly, because irrelevant to what science says, what, what is the halacha criteria for death? Okay, now, now how is this relevant all to the top of organ donation? It's very relevant because this is the key issue and this is why it's so complex and also very much in controversy and there's so many myths about it. It's because of this issue because, of course, as in everything, the beauty of Judaism, we have two opinions as to what's going to be considered halachic death. Some opinions say 
cessation of brain function, as we'll talk about, and some say cessation of cardiac function. So once we have two opinions, so if, now the, the reason why it's so important to organ donation is because, I just want to make sure I'm getting this right, is because obviously, the, as we know, the, the fresher the organ is, so to speak, you have a very small window once you harvest an organ after death. Okay, so in the old days, if someone died, until you had to ascertain their death, their heart stopped pumping and everything, and then did tests to make sure that you can't revive them and resuscitate that. So you were left with this organ, and then you have to first start the surgery then. And some of them, obviously, with a heart, for example, a heart transplant is a very complicated surgery. And by the time you flew it, to, you know, wherever this other person is who needs the heart, or they flew to you, it can take, you know, this was, let's say, in the, like we said, the first heart transplant, it's 1967. So when they were, for example, experimenting with heart transplants, they were literally killing people. I, I've spoken to people who've been, it's happened in South Africa, the first heart transplant. People who were involved admitted they killed patients. They literally, patients were still alive. They removed their heart to, to They experiment. had cardiac and they had brain functioning. Um, no. It's a, well, it's questionable. I don't know. Yeah, so some of them didn't. Some of them, they literally killed patients as part of the, you know, they were in a coma and they were... They said there was irreversible coma, which would be questionable. They didn't have the same machinery and technology to, to ascertain the cessation of brain function at the time as they do today, or at least they weren't using it. So, and I've seen interviews with people who actually met nurses involved in the surgery. The original doctor, I don't think it's no longer alive, but they have a museum in South Africa where you can actually go, and they'll, they admit that they, they did experiment and, and kill patients, and it might have been with consent in some cases, but as you mentioned before, it doesn't make a difference if their murder is murder. Okay, right. And therefore, initially, Ramosha Feinstein has many responses and very against um, heart transplant surgery at the time. He's saying you're killing two people. First of all, you're because you're, you're removing the heart of the of the person who, who has obviously the donor, and if he's technically still alive, that's murder. So you're removing his heart, and yet he's not getting another heart. And the guy you're removing his deficient heart, but he's still alive. And now you're going to put the heart in the beginning. You know, he, he lived for maybe three months, two months, the beginning when the technology was you know was just. Uh, being worked on. So he says you're killing two people with that surgery. You're killing the donor and the recipient because the recipient, we don't know how long, he might have lived for another 10 years right. with his deficient heart. Um, now you're putting in this other heart which the chances of being rejected at the time were probably over 50%. So that's, that's also murder. So it was very controversial. And so now the problem becomes once you have two ways to ascertain death and we're not sure which one is correct, whether it be medically signed uh, or more importantly, halachically, so the issue now becomes... If you take out the, whether it's the heart, whether whatever you're taking out, it's an important organ, causes the person now to die, the, the donor, so you could be killing him. If you take it out too early, where he's not halachically dead, which is in most cases they want to do that because again, the earlier, if his heart is still, the blood is still pumping, that's the ideal time to take it out because then it's still fresh organ and it's, it had the blood pumping right. you know, minutes ago. Once the person died, the window shrinks. Once a person has total cessation of heart function, the window is a much smaller window. So yeah. let, let me clarify something. So according to Halakha, you said there's two opinions. One is brain death, and one is sensation of, you said breathing? Heart, no, well, heart. brain death technically is cessation of breathing, because once your brain stops functioning, then the brain is what controls your breathing. Mechanism. Okay, gotcha. So, so the one is cessation of total cessation of brain function, which is cessation of breathing, Really, that's okay. really the real criteria, as we'll see, and uh, halachically speaking. And then the other one is cessation of heart function. So that's why this is so important, because again, if you so just to, to summarize, if you say that it's cessation of heart function, then if you take the organ out prior to cessation of heart, heart function, cessation of heart function always happens after cessation of breathing. So okay. the heart will continue to function even after someone's brain dies, as long as they're on a ventilator. Um, they'll always continue to function, but for a very short time. But if they're on a ventilator, they can live, they can stay alive for a lot longer. So it's a lot, quote unquote, a lot. Right. What, what about the, you know, there's certain functions of the brain, one that handles the things like breathing and th those natural things. But then we have our more frontal lobe, you know, cognitive functioning. What happens if that area of the brain dies? I don't know if that's possible, but the part of the functioning of the brain that just regulates breathing is still functioning, but the person, you know, Good like question. in a coma, I guess. It's a great question. I, I want to be admit that I don't. I know very little about function of the brain in any which way, but I just know again from the halachic perspective. Um, the, the 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 believe it or not, and this is something which I first saw. This is 
blew my mind also. The Talmud discusses in Masechet Yuma, I think it's 87 or 83, I don't remember, a tractate Yuma discusses this question of what's considered dead. Allah, the reason why it's relevant then, it was before ventilators, discusses the case of a building collapse on Shabbat where, you, as we know, you're allowed to save someone's life, of course, as we mentioned, to violate, you can violate Shabbat to save someone's life without question. The question becomes now, once it becomes a search and rescue effort, you know the person under the rubble is now dead, you can no longer violate Shabbat just to get a body out. So that's a very nice thing. As we're saying, it's important to bury someone, but you wait till after Shabbat. You don't violate Shabbat to bury someone. We don't do funerals on Shabbos, right? So, so the Talmud discusses what happens if I'm going through the rubble and I get to the point where I, I find, I uncover his head and I see he's no longer breathing. Um, so the question is, can I continue removing the rubble? Removing the rubble on Shabbat. The assumption is you violate Shabbat. You know, you're not allowed to do that on Shabbat. So it says the Talmud, no, once you ascertain that he's no longer breathing, put a feather in his nose in those days, so now then uh, he, you, can't, you have to stop removing the rubble, as long as you know no one else is in the rubble, of course. So, no, it's, so that's, and th- that's, and over there, Rashi mentions the heart that you check for a pulse, and you, his heart is no longer beating. So that's the controversy derives from that Gemara, seemingly, as to what is the end of uh, the criteria to, halachically, that ends someone's life. Is it heart okay. pressure? And we're not going to get into that whole topic, because it's very complicated, obviously. But, but the point being is, um, and again, it's not that today... We the criteria halacha doesn't change. So whatever the Talmud there says is the criteria of death, that is going to be the criteria of death today. Okay. Irrelevant of new technology. All the, the new technology does just allows us first of all to resuscitate people. Let's say today, you know, fifty year or hundred years ago, if someone didn't have a pulse, that's it. It was dead. Halachically speaking, there was no way to reverse that. Today, we you know we have a defibrillators and we have Hatzalah comes, you know, with all these fancy machines. They can do open heart surgery in your living room. Right, that's all I'm sure if you're familiar with that organization. So times of technology, of course, has changed. But like we said before, the criteria of death means cessation, irreversible, and is the key word, and we'll talk about that, irreversible cessation of brain function or irreversible cessation of heart function. So okay. today where we have technology, new technology that can now change that, so the halacha didn't change. It was always irreversible cessation. We have new technology which now allows us to be, it's no longer irreversible. We have defibrillators and things that can now make it reversible. So until it's irreversible, you're not dead. Allah okay, speak. gotcha. I want to make it clear again, so I'm just going to restate what I said, which is that if you can save a life by donating a, a organ from a deceased body, it's 100% permitted to do that. We're going to, we'll give you certain criteria when we sum it up, the exact okay. criteria needed, but, but it's 100% permitted because you're saving a life. Saving a life overrides anything, as we said. The only issue is, and the reason why there's people... Are nervous about it, and there's an issue of uh, of controversy is because there is a controversy as to the time of death in Allah. There's different opinions. Again, many opinions say that it's cessation of breathing, and therefore, so that so that and therefore you can donate a body after say after someone's quote unquote brain death. And I, I just I realized I didn't address you said something about it, partial brain cessation. So Shlomo Zalman Orbach. So some say it just has to do with the breathing, as the Gemara says. It's just an issue of breathing. Shlomo okay. Zalman Orbach. Was one of the foremost halachic authorities in Israel around died around twenty years ago. He was of the opinion it's not he wasn't sure how to define the criteria of death and therefore and at his conclusion he says we're not sure and therefore there has to be total cessation of brain, meaning in the sense of it's as when you have total cessation of brain function, it's as if the person is decapitated. So it has to be complete cessation, which is they use something called the Harvard criteria, which I believe was was put forth by Harvard in nineteen 19- 68, if I remember, um, which is that they have to check. It's not just brain stem death, and it's, it's, it has to be the frontal lobe, everything. There can't be any brain activity whatsoever in the brain, in any part of the brain, to be considered halakhically dead. And this is what's used today, according to those opinions who say that's sufficient. By the way, the rabbinut of Israel, the rabbinate of Israel, chief rabbin of Israel, does go with that opinion, that brain dead is considered dead. Most, and I want to make this clear, most of the Haredi world today um, holds... The, the more stringent opinion, which would mean cessation of heart function. Okay, so that's where it becomes, that's where the controversy is. So it's really, it's based on really one main opinion, which is Rabbi, Rabbi Shalom Yosef al Yashav, who also died around 10, 15 years ago, one of the, another great authority in Israel, who he ruled, he was against, he felt brain death was not, a cessation of brain death was not a lachli dead, and therefore 
most of the opinions today go with him, the normative opinions to go with him. So okay. that's where, that's why it's not so simple, and I'll say this very clearly, being just being a card-carrying donor is because if you just put on the back of your license, you check off, you want to donate your organ, so what happens is they're obviously not going to use the halachic criteria, and they're just going to say, oh, whoopie do, we got an organ, there's a major shortage of organs, organs, and and, they're going, might, and the medical community is going to go off what? They're going to the go off? The medical community always will go off brain dead today. Okay. The last 10 years for sure. Okay. Um, now, what's amazing, one of the things, if you want to go to this, again, I'm not plugging them. There is some controversy with the organization, HODES. Um, but if you go to their website, they allow you to carry a card, which you check off on the back of the card. You check off which opinion. So on the back of the card, the front of the card says you're a part, member of the Halachic Organ Donor Society. On the back mm-hmm. of the card, it says... You can check off. It says, first of all, I agree to donate my organs for life-saving transplantation, not for research, because I guess we're going to see research is not a permitted reason to take a you're, you're not saving a life. You're, right. But you're it has to benefit. be specifically for saving a life. Okay. So anything done, if you're just putting into a donor bank, something like that, that's not considered saving a life. Okay. It has to be specifically, there's a patient waiting for the organ. So in many cases, that you're going to have that. So continuing what the card says is, so not for research. And only after the option checked. So it gives you a choice of two halachic opinions. The first one is irreversible, unconscious, and irreversible cessation of autonomous breathing, confirmed by whole brain death. And this addresses your question okay. before. It has to be confirmed by whole brain death, including the brain stem, diagnosed by clinical testing, including an apnea test and confirmatory blood flow testing. Okay? And, they, and this is the opinion, like we said, of the chief rabbin of Israel and others, but it is somewhat considered a controversial opinion in the Haredi world. The other option says ir- you can check off on your card is irreversible cessation of heartbeat. So from a medical perspective, this limits the number of organs that may be recovered because, like we said, it just shortens the, the window of recovery right. of the organs. Okay. It says the number of organs, uh, all preparations, so this is a key point also, all preparations for transplant must be done in consultation with my family-appointed rabbi. All medical procedures must be done with utmost care, respect, and minimum damage to the cadaver. And then it says, you can check off what you wish to donate. And then it says, you put down your rabbi's number. It says emergency contact. But really, you should put down your rabbi, who you is your trusted Orthodox rabbi, who you trust, to help them make the proper decisions within the halachic criteria that he deems fit. So that's the key point. So if you're just a card-carrying member of check it off on the back of your license, or even if you express your wishes to your family, and if your family's not religious, or they don't know what your halachic view might have been, or who you consulted with, so that's a problem. But if you have a, you, could, you don't have to use hosts, you can put it in your living will, your medical will, whatever your, whatever says there, and, and there are many other Jewish organizations that allow for this, where you put your rabbi's number, who you want consulted in time, and God forbid, when that time is necessary. Right. There are rabbis that are spoken to in the Haredi world who will say, you know, once they offer you the other, both opinions on the card, then you know, stay away from them. Just put, make your own, you know, halachic will. But again, that's that's where the controversy comes in. As we know, Haredi world many times, you know, if if this is the accepted, the normative ruling, which they again they go with the ruling of Rebbe Yasha, who says heart function. They're usually so. Then anyone who presents the other side of the picture, they're not so happy with. The person has to speak to their local orthodox rabbi, and 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 that's what's important here. And make a decision based on that. Local Orthodox rabbi is not sufficient because you need someone who's proficient specifically with this question, which we're saying is very complex, brain dead or cessation of heart. It can't just, most rabbis are not so proficient, honestly, in okay. this area. So you got to so have, have the have right rabbi. Yeah. But so, so you are saying that there's really, the only difference of opinion is whether it's brain sensation or heart, so that organ donation is fine across the board based off which death you're talking about. Yes, meaning if someone is halachically dead, and that's where the controversy comes in, I don't know of anyone who would disagree in saying you can take that organ to save another person. Now, by the way, this is only, as we're going to see, and this is, we're not talking about corneas, let's say, where it's not life-saving. Someone needs a cornea, someone's blind, and they need a cornea transplant. So now I want to donate my cornea. So that is a, that's where it's a whole different issue, because over there, we're saying this applies... The whole override here, as we're saying, is that where we, we have to overcome the challenges is because pikoch nefesh, you're saving a life. So a kidney, a heart, there's no uh, lung in many cases. Right, liver, on, anything that... Re- something that you're literally saving the person's life, that's where we're saying this is applicable to. Okay. Once you get into areas where it's questionable, for example, a cornea, uterus transplant, so the woman's not sick, 
just because she doesn't have a uterus, it just means she can't have children. Right. You know, listen, it's a te- and not to, not to sound callous about not having children. That's a terrible, it's not, a, it's not right. a fun thing, and I empathize with people going through that, but it's, they're 100% healthy, quote-unquote, halachically speaking. They're not... But, but they can't fulfill the mitzvah. Uh, True. Yes. So we, we might allow them to overcome rabbinic prohibitions, and some do allow that in these cases, rabbinic prohibitions, because maybe mutilating a body is only rabbinic, maybe burying a body is only... So there, are, there are different leniencies for that. But we're here talking about, again, initially we're talking about to save a life, and if someone is 100% halachically dead, depending on these two opinions, depending on your rabbi's opinion, your halach decisor, whoever you consult with, it's 100% permitted as far as I know. I don't know anyone who would disagree with that. The, the concern is it has to be done with these criteria. And I'm just going to go through quickly what the criteria are one, okay. to, to wrap it up. There, there are at least four criteria for the donation. One is, I would say, you shouldn't start planning organ donations to be put into a, a bank. As we said, there has to be what's called a patient who's ready to accept that organ and it's saving their life. Okay, number two, the donor must be completely verified as halachically dead. And that's what we mentioned depends on these two opinions. will depend on two opinions we spoke about above of, of cessation of heart function, cessation, total cessation of brain function. Number three, as we just mentioned, the recipient must be in a life-threatening situation. And number four, it is ideal if the donor agreed during his lifetime to donate his organs after death. Because again, the question becomes who owns someone's body after death, which is an interesting question. Right. Now, now again, is it a mitzvah? You don't really have, after death, you have no mitzvahs anymore. So it can't be your obligation because you're dead. Right. Okay, so the per- person, a dead person has no more obligations. Now it is, of course, you know, you get, it will help, assuming you're doing a mitzvah, you're saving someone's life, hopefully it will help you wherever you are and give you some brownie points up there and we're all going to need it when right. we get up there. So it's, it's in that sense it's a good thing, but you can't say it's obligatory for the dead person. So who owns the body? Does the family own the body? This is a different dilemma in halacha. Who owns someone's body after death? As you mentioned before, you know, God owns, we're all on loan from God for 80 right. years. So we really don't own our bodies and our families don't own our bodies. But, of course, it's ideal for um, if the donor agreed prior to his lifetime to donate the organs. We don't just go ahead and do it anyway against the donor's wishes. Gotcha. In certain cases, you might be allowed to. Again, that would be consult your halachic authority on that because, again, we're saving a life and that overrides anything. It's not stealing per se, but we don't, you know, we're not going to condone going in and stealing organs from the, you know, from right. the hospital. So those those are basically the four criteria again to save a life. Now, just to wrap it up, so with the as far as if it's non life saving organ, so that's where you get into other questions, and I don't know if we'll have time to go through all of them, but um, like a cornea, it's more problematic in those cases because again, you're not saving a life. So over there, it gets into issues if it's rabbinical. Um, if the prohibition, the challenges we mentioned before, um, which is like we're saying, you know, burying the dead, and then if there are rabbinical challenges, so many will say, so it's okay to violate rabbinic law, even for cases, let's say, to, like you mentioned, you know, where someone could, uh, could you know, allow them to have kids or etc. Uh, some of those things allow them to see cornea. And, and so that's where there's more controversy. That sums it up. I want to emphasize two things. Having a standard donor card is never a good idea. Um, that's important right. to note. And, and, and there is, because there's such a desperation today for harvesting organs, I've heard of stories, again, horror stories, where in the hospitals, even prior to total cessation of death, someone is just in a vegetative state, they're not going to necessarily use the Harvard criteria to, to ascertain brain death. They're just such in a rush to harvest the organs many times that they'll do it prior to the present halachically dead, even if in the opinion of brain death. And therefore, you have to be very careful where it says it cannot be done without consultation with... Rabbi X, who's, again, proficient in the matter, will know what to ask for prior to them removing the organs and to make sure it's done in a halachic matter. So I want to emphasize that again, that it should be clear, whatever living will you're writing or whatever card you're carrying, it needs to state that with the rabbi's number, or your family should at least know that, um, your next of kin, the, that's key part of this, because without that, there are many higher stories of them harvesting organs prior to someone being considered Forget about halachically dead, even clinically dead. Right. So, uh, so that's that's the key point. Okay. Sign up. Beautiful, Rabbi. I appreciate your expertise and sharing with us everything we need to know about this matter. Very informative, very helpful. And it sounds like there's some other topics that I can bring you on to talk about <laughs> uh, now that I can make you a sort of ongoing official guest of the Shmuel Podcast. Yeah, it was my honor to be here. 
If you enjoyed this episode, please consider supporting Torch so they can continue to spread Torah wisdom to the world by making a donation at torchweb.org and clicking donate in the top right corner of the page. And if you would like to get in contact with our host with comments, suggestions for future topics of learning, or questions for him or his guest rabbis, you may email him at president at torchweb.org.